Moving on, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Mila Sol. It is truly a great honor for me to host today's Latin Plaza. Today's event will be presented in English. I would like to welcome and thank all those who joined us today in the midst of COVID-19. Today's Latin Plaza is held with limited number of participants attended in accordance with social distancing rule with an aim to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. Please keep in mind to wear facial masks through, all throughout the event in this conference room and be careful to maintain the proper distance between the seats. Thank you very much. Deputy Minister Kim Khan, Mr. Bruno Figueroa, Ambassador of Mexico in Korea, along with Ambassadors of the Diplomatic Corps in Seoul are with us today. Latin Plaza was launched in June 2018 as a public diplomacy platform of the Latin American Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Korea, to provide wide open opportunities for Korean nationals and abroad to get closer understanding of Latin American countries as well as the relationship between Korea and Latin America. In this regard, today's Latin Plaza undoubtedly will serve us as a window to better understand our friend country, Mexico, and Mexico's contribution to the Korean War, especially in the year commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Before getting us start, let us have a moment of silence for those who sacrifice their lives in the Korean War. I'd like to invite all of you to rise from your seats for a moment of silence. Moment of silence. As you are. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, <coughs> let's begin today's event by having the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kim Khan, who will address his welcoming speech. Please welcome the Deputy Minister, Mr. Kim Khan. In this regard, 
to leave Latin Plaza, despite its informal character, will undoubtedly serve as a window to introduce the brave stories of Mexican veterans for the first time to the Korean public. It is my sincere wish that today's event will be an opportunity to reaffirm that Korea and Mexico are long-lasting friends. We have a deep and firm history, history of fighting together, as well as sharing common values. In Mexico, there is a saying like this, if one gets close to a good tree, there will be a good shadow. I am certain that our two countries will continue to nurture our bilateral, bilateral partnership into a well-known field that will benefit both our peoples and the international community. Last but not least, I would like to extend once again my deepest gratitude to all the Korean War veterans for their noble sacrifice and dedication. Thank you very much. That was uh, too abstract for me, too far away in time and in space. But when I was posted to Korea, uh, so a little more than three years ago, I remembered this friend of my father, and I promised myself to dig up the story of Mexicans because I was sure he was not alone. But. Uh, Time passed by with uh, so many uh, busy activities as an ambassador. And uh, at the end of last year, when suddenly I realized that 2020 was going to be the 70th anniversary of the beginning of the war, I said, now it's time to look for this. So I mobilized uh, my friends in the foreign ministry in Mexico. Uh, I had contacts in the United States. Our embassy also uh, started doing some research in Washington, D.C. And little by little, we got amazing information that I want to, to share with us, with you, uh, this morning. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 stopped uh, the research a few months ago in Mexico and in the United States. But anyway, I am sure that uh, what we already have uh, will be of the interest of everybody. Thank you. Um, now it's time to listen to the presentation of the ambassador. As I invite ambassador to the podium, please give him a big round of applause.
First of all, I would like to thank deeply the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Minister Kim Gun, for his uh, very kind words, especially uh, regarding uh, the earthquake this morning in Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, and especially also the Director General for Latin America and the Caribbean at MOFA, Mr. Juan Kyung Te, uh, who allowed me to present the story of the Mexicans and Mexican-American soldiers in the Korean War in the frame of the Latin Plaza. So what uh, I will tell you this morning, if someone can change, thank you very much. Uh, the, the government of Mexico contributed to the Korean War with humanitarian aid, that is a well-known fact. But in this presentation, I will talk about the participation of a very little known category of soldiers who in Korea lost their lives, got wounded, were prisoners of war, <clears throat> or came back safely and became later veterans. I am referring to soldiers of Mexican origin. I will explain how many they were, the difficulty in tracing them and their known stories. And finally, I will explain why I think they also deserve a small place in the history books on the Korean War. So the first thing I would like to highlight is that it is not an anecdotal presence. You have here a letter from a US Congresswoman from California, Loretta Sanchez, dated November 10, 2007. And here she mentions that over 180,000 Hispanic Americans served in the war. Hispanic is a term designating people coming from Spanish-speaking countries, obviously Spain and all Latin America. She mentions over 180,000, which is around 10% of all United States armed forces serving in theater in Korea. There is no comprehensive, complete research about this topic, not in Mexico nor in the United States. Some books have been published, excellent research has been done, but again, not comprehensive. We don't have yet detailed data, which is very difficult to obtain. To starting with, soldiers were registered by ethnicity at the time, and Mexicans were mostly registered as white. Only their individual registration sheets stored at the archives of the Department of Defense in Washington, D.C. mention their birthplace. So files have to be consulted one by one. <coughs> In the 70s, the United States government started to mainstream the use of Hispanic or Latino in its social data and population information. So we found that the US Department of Veterans Affairs mentions in its census of 1990, that's the document referred here, the number of 130,000 Hispanic veterans still alive at the time in 1990. So uh, they, at the time, most were between 60 and 70 years old. So who were those Hispanics? There was an important group coming from Puerto Rico. In that census, they are precisely mentioned, exactly 29,500 Puerto Rican veterans. They were some soldiers coming from Central and South America, but they were numerically quite few. So the number of soldiers of Mexican origin was around 100,000 still alive in 1990. Another way of estimating the number of soldiers of Mexican origin is through the death records. In the National Archives of the United States, we found a similar range, 3.7 thousand out of 36,000 and something casualties. That's a little bit more than 10% of the total of American casualties. So let's come back to the war. A first question is, was Mexico part of the coalition for the liberation of South Korea? 
And the immediate answer is no. Definitely, Mexico was not in the group of the 16 countries who sent troops. The only Latin American country which sent troops was Colombia, around 5,100 soldiers. Was Mexico in the list of countries who sent humanitarian assistance? Indeed, it was in a list longer than the previous one, as you can see in this slide. South Korea got the support of the Security Council of the United Nations, and the coalition became the first UN-supported international army. It had international multilateral legitimacy. My country decided to donate humanitarian assistance, food and medical supplies in the range of $350,000 of that time, uh, 1951. So one question that could arise is why Mexico as a country did not send troops to the Korean War. Mexico indeed participated in the Second World War as an allied country since May 1942. We sent an airplane, airplane squadron to the Pacific, the Squadron 201. But at the end of the war, the rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union started what is known as the Cold War and the division of Europe and part of the world in two camps, including, of course, Korea. Mexico did not want to be dragged in the Cold War and believed in non-alignment and neutrality. And this is why my country did not participate in the Korean War with troops. Mexico, by the way, has not participated in any conflict since the Second World War. So how did Mexicans and Mexican-Americans got involved in the Korean War? Those were individual choices for those coming from Mexico and for those who were born in the United States of Mexican origin, they were drafted and enlisted in the armed forces. But I want you to know this, any young man of Mexican origin who did not want to go to the war could just cross the border south and stay there. That did not happen, considering their numbers in the armed forces. As said informally, they did not chicken out. Demography and migration partly explain the number of soldiers of Mexican origin in the US armed forces. Between 1910 and 1930, they were almost one million migrants, Mexican migrants, crossing the border to the US. Many at the beginning fleeing the Mexican Revolution. At that time, the entry to the US was very easy. You just paid a few cents at the border, no question asked. Now, many of those one million migrants had children either before crossing and they took them with them to the US or when they settled down in the United States. Many of those boys born between 1910 and 1930 became soldiers of the Korean War. We also established in 1942 a workers' program with the United States known as the Bracero Program, uh, especially in the fields, in order for those workers to take the place of soldiers who were combating in the Second World War. But this program remained until 1964. We are talking about 4.6 million workers, mostly male, or around 209,000 per year. Many of those workers, when they finished their three years contract, decided to enlist as volunteers in the US Army. In 1950, in the territory of the US, besides Mexicans, there were a few Latin American migrants from Cuba, Puerto Rico, Central and South America, but nothing to do as what happened after the 60s. 
Most of the migrants at the time came from Europe and countries around the Mediterranean. We know that around 1950, more than 80% of the Mexicans migrants lived in the border states between California and Texas. Some ventured north to Chicago and the industry belt, but still very few went much farther to New York or Florida. That explains the concentration of Hispanics or Latino soldiers coming precisely from those southern states of the United States. And coming from worker families, they were more easily drafted or volunteered because they saw very few opportunities. And that's why Hispanics comprised only 3.5% of the US population at the time, but 10% of the US armed forces during the Korean War, as I mentioned before. We do not have yet the information of the place of origin of the soldiers coming from Mexico, since that data has not been, been compiled. The Mexican government did not have this information. What we know is that most came from Central and North Mexico. One question that we asked ourselves is, were they mostly Mexicans or Mexican-Americans? And this is very difficult. How many were 100% Mexicans? We don't know. As I just mentioned, there is no official record of the Mexican citizens enlisted in the US Army. Those were individual choices, and the US did not notify foreign governments about foreign citizens volunteering or also being drafted. Those of Mexican parents and born in the US could choose to be Mexican at their majority. Mexicans lost their citizenship when they entered a foreign army or made military service in another country. That's in our constitution. But since the Second World War, a bilateral agreement between Mexico and the United States said and allowed young men to serve in the army of the other country without lo losing their nationality or citizenship. So, and finally, does it really matter if they were Mexicans or Mexican-Americans? For the American Armed Forces, there is no distinction between being American or Mexican. And for the Mexican government, both categories deserve the same respect. And I give you a couple of examples. Amin David was born in Mexico and after the war decided to become an American citizen. He became a Latino activist who founded Los Amigos of Orange County, California in 1978. At the right, Roberto Sierra Barbosa, also from Mexico. He was a radio operator in the Marines during the war. He later studied agriculture in California and came back to Mexico. Today, at 90 years old, he resides in the city of Guadalajara. I had a chance to talk to him a couple of months ago. He mentioned to me that uh, he never talked about his experience in the war with his own family. And I was one of the few outside his friends who knew his story from him. And he's very proud of his son, Ivan Sierra, who is a fellow ambassador and Mexican career diplomat, a very good friend of mine. But his son never heard his stories, his father's story about his participation in the war. Because of their number, soldiers of Mexican origin fought in many fronts. They blended with the other soldiers in all armed forces branches. They were mostly privates, some became corporals or surgeons, and there were very, very few officers. As Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, they had to be low-key. They were not allowed to speak Spanish at the time. Corporal Jesus Rodriguez mentioned in his memoirs, and yes, by the way, in Mexico, Jesus is quite a common name, 
He mentioned, prior to Korea, Sergeant Hoover Baker kept the Mexicans kind of separated in different squads. In garrison, the army didn't like for us to talk in Spanish. It was a no-no. But it was hard to enforce because they couldn't be watching everyone all of the time. Being of humble origin could be also an asset in Korea. They were dis disciplined and did not falter in front of danger. Jesus Rodriguez was 17 when he volunteered in Los Angeles. He was then a shoe shine at the time. And he wrote, I used to pray a lot. Another thing that helped me was that I was street smart from before going into the service. On the streets, I learned how to fight. Something else that helped me survive Korea was that going hungry wasn't new to me and didn't hurt me. We have found very interesting information. Three days after the beginning of the war, on June 28, 1950, an American bomber made a reconnaissance flight over Korea and disappeared in the Yellow Sea, close to Jindo Island. There was only one survivor, and Sergeant Joe Campos was considered missing in action. He was born in Arizona in 1932 of Mexican parents. It took nearly three years for his remains to be found and identified, so he could receive a proper burial. Joe Campos with his mates were the first foreign casualties of the war. A few days later, on July 5th, 1950, the US Army confronted North Korean troops in Osan, now known as the Osan Battle. Unfortunately, there were 20 soldiers killed in action, 130 wounded or missing, and around 36 captured. Today, it is acknowledged that those were the first American casualties in battle. Among the first prisoners of war was Florentino Gonzalez, born in 1928 in Chicago, Illinois, from Mexican parents. Florentino Gonzalez was forced to march in Seoul for North Korean propaganda purposes. And you can see those very unusual and interesting pictures to the right uh, of those prisoners of war marching with uh, propaganda. And one of those guys in the right is precisely Florentino Gonzalez. He hopefully survived the war. We also found only a few weeks ago a testimony about an all Mexican squad. If we consider the large number of Mexican American soldiers, there must have been Indeed, several squads or platoons composed by Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. In this particular case reported, a squad from the A Company of the 35th Regimental Combat Team of the 25th Division. And it's again Corporal Jesus Rodriguez who uh, mentioned this in his memoirs. He wrote, once we got in Korea, the Mexican squad had something going. Sergeant Baker's all Mexican squad was moving, was moving and doing it right. Most were anonymous soldiers, but some were distinguished. Here are two examples. Eugenio Eugene Obregón lost his life, saving several comrades at the beginning of the war. Because of his heroic act, there is a school in California and a ship from the US Navy with his name. General Richard Cavazos, he distinguished himself in Korea and Vietnam and was the first Mexican-American four-star general in the US Army. He became the head of the US Army Forces Command. He died in 2017 in San Antonio, Texas. He was very much esteemed by generations of professional soldiers and officers. General Robert Abrams, commander of the United States Forces Korea and the United Nations Command, told me a couple of months ago that he knew very well General Cavazos 
and he, considered, he considers him one of his most important mentors, someone he admired a lot. Lyndon B. Johnson, the successor of President G.F. Kennedy, wrote a prologue to an authoritative book about the Mexican-American contributions to the Second World War and the Korean War. And he said, the American soldiers of Mexican origin served with distinction. They fought courageously. They gave their lives when need be valiantly. So many received the highest armed forces awards and decorations, as you can see in the list to the left. There are a few books about the story of the soldiers I am depicting to you. Historians dig up facts and make us see history from different and new perspective, like archaeologists do. For instance, we know more today about the Goryeo dynasty and society through archaeological evidence and scientific interpretation than what we knew about the Goryeos 500 years ago. Time is bringing new lights on several facts considered not very important at the time of the Korean War. One is the contribution of several ethnicities within the US Army, and it is not only about those of Mexican origin. There is a wonderful story about the recognitions of the Borinquineers as the Puerto Rican regiment named itself. This is the 65th All Puerto Rican Infantry Regiment that was established in 1899 and which fought in several wars within the US Armed Forces including, of course, Korea. But it was an award-winning documentary from the year 2007 that triggered many emotions and made them known to the general public. And the remaining veterans were then recognized. There is also the very interesting case of the Navajo Indians who served during the Second World War and the Korean War as radio operators and code talkers. Now their story is known, and uh, just a few weeks ago, it was very interesting to read in the Korean newspapers that the Korean government announced that it was sending 10,000 face masks and hand sanitizers to the Navajo veterans from the Korean War. There must be a lot of dramatic and fascinating stories of Mexican and Mexican-American veterans waiting to be told and revalued in Korea, in the United States, and especially in my country, Mexico. I end my presentation thanking again the Foreign Ministry of Korea for this unique opportunity and the Patriot and Veterans Ministry for its interest in doing more research on this new topic regarding the Korean War. Thank you very much. Kam Samnida. Thank you again for your great presentation. As a Korean national, the um, Ambassador Figueroa's presentation was quite touching and also informative enough to learn about unknown facts about the Mexican soldiers' sacrifices in the Korean War. Um, and after listening to the presentation, I have a couple of questions I'd like to raise. First, um, I want to know what you were further trying to make these forgetting sacrifices known to the public. Well, I hope that uh, this is only the beginning of an adventure, as I mentioned, to dig up uh, so many untold, or maybe told, but they, that they hidden in many homes, in many archives. And uh, I think it's not too difficult to look for those stories. Uh, even though we're talking about 70 years ago, it's still not that far. And we know that uh, many people, many veterans, have been writing memoirs uh, in the past decades. So. We just uh, found 
the memoirs of this Corporal Jesus Rodriguez. But just imagine if we find many other memoirs and if, if we can get uh, more information, if not from veterans, at least from their families, and of course from archives. I'm already looking forward to what you're going to discover and share with us. And um, as ambassador to Korea, how would you um, describe the relations between Korea and Mexico? Well, we are uh, very close, we have a very close relationship. Um, we will celebrate our 60th uh, anniversary of diplomatic relations in two years but uh, again our close history goes back much farther in history the first Korean migration to Mexico happened in 1905 um, we have this uh, participation of Mexicans during the war also Mexican presence since the 60s with the Mexican missionaries, uh, particularly in Sorocto Island, the island where uh, people ill with leper uh, were confined. But especially, I would say, in the last 25 years, our relationship has exploded in so many terms, in economic terms, in uh, our political relationship, we share the same values, we fight the same causes in the international arena, and uh, also we are part of the globalization, and that's why we are so uh, close together. Uh, our trade is above $22 billion a year, uh, so there is much to say about our relationship. Thank you. Now I will open the floor if anyone has any question or comment on the presentation of the ambassador. Please raise your hand and please um, address who you are first and then you can ask the question. So, uh, as the only, I think, American in the audience, I appreciate your uh, contributions and, and I, I appreciate the, the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I, and I, obviously, America appreciates the Mexicans who fought with us uh, in the Korean War. I was wondering if that, that uh, agreement, bilateral agreement that you mentioned, was that still in effect today? Uh, and when they fought in the Korean War, were those soldiers, uh, did they understand that? And did they, have, did, did they retain their Mexican citizenship when they, when they joined the U.S. military? Uh, this bilateral agreement started in 19, 1942 and lasted uh, until 1952 uh, and was not renewed. Uh, indeed, those Mexican nationals who wanted to return their Mexican nationality could do so after serving in the U.S. Uh, forces. And uh, they just uh, they just asked for that either at the Mexican consulate in the U.S. or coming back to Mexico. There is no record of any difficulty of uh, any person who uh, had his nationality rejected because of having been part of the U.S. Armed Forces. Okay. Good. I, I wish you good luck in finding those documents to you know to, to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, any others? Hello, I'm, uh, I work at the uh, Foreign Ministry for uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it was very lively history that I really feel a uh, pleasure to listen to. And thank you so much for your presentation. But those who reside in the Mexico, I don't, I, I just wanted to hear, like, whether those who served in the military in the Korean War and now reside in Mexico has received uh, duly respect by the Mexican, like, Mexican citizens and at the same time whether they have received any financial support from the Korean government and that's my question, thank you. Thank you, this is a very 
interesting question. And uh, it's difficult. Firstly, we have to know the precise number of uh, veterans who are still alive and living in Mexico. I had the chance to, to talk to one of them, Mr. Sierra, just because when uh, some people knew in the foreign ministry that uh, uh, we were conducting this research, someone told me, well, you know that the father of Ambassador Ivan Sierra is a Korean War veteran. But that was just by chance. Um, and I can only tell his story because of, I, I know of no other. And it's a little bit sad because he told me that in Guadalajara, where many American veterans reside, especially from the Vietnam War, um, he met with uh, those uh, veterans once a year in November 10 uh, in one monument. Uh, but uh, I asked him if he received any support, if he, if he asked for that uh, to the US or any government. And he told me no, that uh, he didn't and he was not interested. Uh, unfortunately, in Mexico, there was much indifference for a long time about those soldiers. And I will tell it in one sentence, because it was not Mexico's war as such. Uh, so that's time to, to make those stories known and to have a proper recognition, especially in Mexico, as in the other countries. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Marcelo. Uh, I think that this is Ambassador Bruno Figueroa is not just a great ambassador, he's a, an extraordinary researcher as well as I had the, the chance to, 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 to witness when I was reading his book concerning the history of, of uh, the Mexican aid for development uh, more than 100 years now in, in, in this sense. So, uh, uh, it's for me a privilege to, to know this. To, to, it is definitely very, very interesting. I was wondering, I, I noticed that most of the primary source of information come from the United States, from personal experiences. I was wondering what about um, if you have already identified possible sources here in Korea as well as a, as a source of information for to, to Complete. I, I think this, this I, I, as far as I understand, this uh, research is still in progress and you will continue doing this. And I'm confident, I'm sure that in the future we will see a, a great publication as a result of this research. Congratulations and thank you again for the invitation and sharing with us what you have found until now. Well, to stop the interview, can you please identify yourself? Sorry, I didn't do that. My name is Marco Chicas, Ambassador of Guatemala in thank Korea. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, well, that's a, a, a good question regarding sources in Korea. We haven't uh, looked at that. And uh, well, I hope since the uh, Ministry of Patriots and Veterans offered a support to continue this research, uh, I am sure that uh, there is something that could be found uh, here. Uh, what is easier is to get now information through the internet, mostly coming from American sources, because Americans have been uh, conducted interviews to veterans. There are uh, several initiatives to get the memoirs of veterans alive through interviews. Some of them you can find in the net. Uh, but definitely, uh, if there's something that could be uh, found in Korea, we certainly would like to do so. Well, again, I want to uh, thank for the generosity of the Foreign Ministry in uh, giving us this amazing opportunity to present the case of those uh, until now forgotten soldiers. And I am confident that uh, this will change with time, uh, as happened with other 
parts of the history of the Croatia. Okay. Thank you again. I think that there's another question. Uh, the first congratulation for this uh, effort, extraordinary. Uh, second, I'm thinking maybe in the future we need to organize one commemoration in this world about thinking in the American people. The American people, I believe, yeah, two days ago, uh, the ambassador of Peru said to me that uh, some soldiers from Peru country, and uh, maybe we need to continue their, uh, in this research, um, obviously it's very sad about, uh, imagine, Colombia sent to the, the Korean War 5,100, 5, and now there uh, uh, now leads maybe 440. I can imagine how many, obviously between 86 to 96 years old. Uh, suppose Mexican Mexican cities is maybe huge. I, I don't know how many people now, and and obviously uh, it's a moment to recognize uh, in, from here uh, uh, this say the message to the Mexican citizen <coughs> the importance of uh, their efforts in this world. Thank you. I believe you're from the. Ah, Juan Carlos Ká is the pastor of Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I believe today's presentation helped us to understand better um, how much we owe the Mexican soldiers and other Latin American soldiers who participated um, in the Korean War for what we have now, the, all the prosperity and the freedom in Korea that we enjoy. So thank you very much. It was very very uh, touching, interesting, and I hope that the you know, investigation will continue. And um, also I want to mention that, uh, that uh, today's presentation of the Latin Plaza will be uploaded online um, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs YouTube channel and Facebook page. So please feel free to share with your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. Now, this is the end of today's Latin Plaza. And I'd like to thank you again for taking time to take part in today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you.